I'd like to welcome you all to this week's report. Today is uh, Thursday, August 10th. Got a little bit of uh, precipitation here in the uh, this morning. There was a little bit of rain here in Long Beach. I saw up at the Channel Islands. There was a little bit heavier rain offshore there. So um, that's supposed to clear up here today and tomorrow, I think. But uh, kind of go back to a normal summer pattern by the weekend. Uh, doesn't look too bad weather-wise anywhere. You know, there's a little bit of wind on Sunday up at the Channel Islands and outside of Clemente, but most of the areas you go be fishing on a private boat should be fine this weekend. Uh, and even the areas that are windy, it's not too windy for a sport boat, and that's usually the boats that'll be out in those zones. So, uh, got a lot to talk about, so let's head up to the Channel Islands. Uh, fishing up there has been pretty steady, good service activity. A lot of bass, a few sea bass, a few yellows, a few halibut kind of thing. You know, there's a we're off that full moon phase up there, so it's kind of getting back to more of a normal summer pattern. My friend uh, Larry Heron had a trip to Santa Cruz Island over the weekend, and he had really good bass fishing, and also got a nice sea bass for his clients there. So, uh, you know, just good, fun summertime fishing at Santa Cruz Island, and most of that stuff you're fishing is in the lead of the island anyway, if you're bass fishing. So, you know, it's a little bit windy up there, you just gotta worry about the, uh, the crossing, but you should have nice fishing weather once you get to the island if you're fishing the uh, backside, which is the lee up there. Um, you know, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna skip Clemente again. You know, there's just not really a lot of coverage out there right now. And um, I'm sure it's biting. I'm sure you go there and catch PLs on the front or go fish Calicos or whatever. But there's just not really a lot of guys out there fishing that stuff. Um, Catalina's getting more traffic. Uh, my friends, uh, Benny Florentino of Coastal Charters and his son Matt uh, went out there the other day. They had really good calico bass fishing on the AFCO hard baits and also uh, got a yellow, which they released, which is nice to see. That's just a normal suburb pattern. You know, you just run around the backside looking for areas with current and hopefully anything other than gin clear water and you can usually find some biting fish or fish at least by the lure. Uh, setting up a chumming for the most part, like sport boats, you're just going to end up with a bunch of sea lions. So, uh, yeah, you know, if I was going to go to, uh, go to Cat, I'd probably fish some of the, the kelp beds on the backside, east end through, you know, like Salter Birdie there. And uh, also, you know, actually in the morning, I'd probably try fishing boilers along the beach. And then once the sun came out, I'd try fishing that kelp. That seems to be a big uh, difference maker a lot of times, having a little bit of, uh, a little bit of sun out there. Uh, locally, Sand bass fishing is as good, continues to be really good uh, in the Long Beach, China Beach areas. Some of the boats are getting limits. I think the Freelance had limits for 60 people the other night at Twilight, and I haven't heard about that in a long time. That's 300 fish, which is great to see them getting out there and getting on some fish. Barracuda are still biting, not as good as, uh, as they have been, but there's still some to be caught in the afternoon hours. Uh, private boaters are doing really good on those sand bass as well. Uh, Benny sent me some more pictures of uh, one of his charter groups and one of the state local. They had really good sand bass fishing on the artificial lures. I think they were getting them on hookup baits and knowing him, probably the big hammer swim baits as well. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, that's good fishing to be had. I fished PV on Saturday uh, morning. Not the best time to go up there, but uh, once the sun came out, we had pretty good calico fishing in areas where we had a little bit of uh, current and that wasn't too strong and um yeah we got most of our fish uh, actually all of our fish in that little six inch mc slug again which is becoming pretty repetitive me talking about it but it's the only thing i've been fishing it's a lot of fun uh key to getting bit was finding areas where the submerged kelp was meeting up against service kelp and that's usually little eddies so there'll be a reef that uh blocks off the current so you have strong current going and then you'll see kelp way down and you'll find a little spot where the, the kelp's on the surface. That surface kelp is caused by the current not going through there during a, due, you know, due to uh, the current's interaction with the reef or ridge and the calico bass will use it as a wall to uh, ambush bait again. So they gonna be hanging right on the edge of where that laid down kelp is on the, along that surface kelp. And that's, uh, that was pretty much the pattern on Saturday to go around and uh, just hit those spots. You know, you could pull up, make two or three casts, and either bite or they wouldn't, and move on to the next one. And we had to pick up, pick apart quite a few spots to uh, to find biting bass. But once we got on that pattern, it was pretty consistent. You know, and uh, what really helps is to get a good idea of what you're looking at. Um, you can use Google Earth, or you can, you know, look while you're underwater. 
Uh, or you do what I did the last week. It was my wife's birthday, so I got a nice uh, helicopter tour at a Long Beach airport, like a 40-minute tour, and uh, she really enjoyed that. And uh, I brought Matt along, and what we enjoyed was cruising along the PV coastline and checking out the reef structure of all the different uh, points of PV and getting a better idea of what that stuff looked like from the air. Took a lot of video, took a lot of photos to uh, cross-reference stuff and understand some of our, maybe expand on some of our theories as to why things happen in certain places. So, you know, if you're looking for something nice to do for your wife, you know that I, this place I got no affiliation with. I went to this Athlion, I'll put a link to it here, uh, helicopter thing. You know, it's like 500 bucks for a private helicopter tour. Well worth the money, especially when you can uh, scope out some spots and uh, your wife will never know it. And luckily she does not watch my videos, so she still won't know. That it was a part birthday, part scouting trip. Um, you know, heading offshore, uh, Cortez Bank is biting. Or it made Cortez and or Tanner. They're kind of uh, interchangeable. Um, not a lot of boats out there. It's mostly the long range boats and some of the boats. I know the Thunderbirds have been out there in the Freedom, some of the uh, Orange County LA based boats. They're fishing on the anchor, getting a really nice grade of yellowtail. Uh, they're also getting some smaller bluefin tuna that are sometimes biting on the anchor, sometimes biting nearby. Very classic bite out there. You know, we had, I can't remember how long ago it's been now, 30 years ago, we used to go out there in the fall a lot and have very similar fishing. I'm sure it was that way during the summer as well, but we never went out there. We were out, you know, fishing offshore, fishing albacore, fishing, things like that. But uh, come the fall, we'd always run out to the Cortez in, in you know, September, October and have that, uh, that steady, nice grade of yellowtail on the anchor with some flash of the bluefin now and then. But, uh, you know, the boats are also getting some bigger bluefin out there, and, you know, there's they're fish scattered from there to Clemente and everywhere else in between. So, um, I know the multi-day boats are, that are fishing bluefin, you know, during the day, they're sometimes when they're done with those, going to fishing Cortez and Tanner and stuff like that, and that's a... Uh, that's just a real fun fishery out there that uh, you don't have to deal with a bunch of private boats chopping you up at. Um, I'm going to jump down south. You know, I feel kind of bad for the full day boats at San Diego this year because they really got the short end of the offshore fishing stick here. Um, very inconsistent tuna fishing down there. The stuff's far. It's mostly up here. And uh, they're catching Dorado. They're catching some yellow fins, some yellows on kelp paste. Problem is, if they're fishing in Mexican water, that Dorado limit's only two fish. So, um, it's nice for catching them. But uh, honestly, if you want to go on a trip where you're fishing offshore, I'd probably come up to uh, come up this way or get on an overnight trip out of San Diego that's going to fish up this way. Um, so, you know, speaking of fishing offshore, which I'm currently not doing, which it would probably be a lot easier right now to go catch fish than it was the last time I went. But um, I've been seeing a lot of mistakes that guys are making when they're fishing offshore on their private boats. And I think that they're just doing it because they don't know any better or they haven't been taught properly. But I've got some ideas about a better way of fishing offshore and I'm going to share them here and you know if you disagree with them that's fine you can post something in the comments but um, this thought process started for me the last time with the Catalina fishing bass on the east end. The entire morning we're sitting on that east end every boat from Long Beach, Newport, Oceanside are all running to that east end of Catalina and hooking a hard right turn with you know a straight line to the 499 or they step off the Clemente escarpment and what's happening is none of those boats have any opportunity to run into something that boats are not already on if they're just 100% on tracks from their harbor to the east end to the other they're riding. Sure they may stumble into something on the way but the boat that ran by 10 minutes earlier and the boat that ran by 10 minutes earlier than that and half an hour before that will have run over the same thing. And, you know, you don't notice it when you're offshore. But when you're sitting a cat, for an hour, there's never not a boat going by and hooking that right turn to run up to those tuna grounds. So, while you can get up there and fish around the other boats and have a chance of catching some fish, it's not necessarily the best way of doing it or 
making your chances of finding those fish uh, for yourself. So let's say that I'm gonna run at Newport Harbor and my end game is to end up somewhere near the fleet, hopefully not, uh, looking for tuna. So rather than take the shortest line, which would be these and a cat and up, I would say, you know, let me run down to the 277, run up to the 152, run out to the 500 fathom curve off the backside of cat, up to about Ben Weston, let me hook it out towards the mackerel bank, and then worst case scenario, I make it up towards the fleet. We're in a part of the year now where these fish are scattered throughout our local waters. You can find them anywhere potentially. Um, but if you run where the other boats are running, all you're gonna find is other boats. And I consistently see boats uh, kind of doing their own thing, the guys that know what they're doing, you know. The guys you don't see making that hard left or hard right is boats like the Blackfish out of Newport Harbor, you know, guys like uh, Dwayne or uh, Billy Kay or any of these guys that fish bluefin uh, regularly. And I brought the blackfish because they, they've been on them constantly here for the last few weeks. And Mitch just sent me a, a pretty cool video of them just all bent up and by themselves. So you can watch that real quick here. Yeah, anyway, so, you know, it's, uh, if you're a private boater and you want to get better at this stuff and you don't have the confidence to just do what I'm saying here and turn left when everybody else turns right, you would do well to charter a boat like the Blackfish or any of the, you know, even like Seasons or Pinnacle or any of those different boats like that and spend a day on the water with those guys or hire one of those guys to come out on your boat. And you know, it's a very expensive thing to do that compared to running your own boat. But you're gonna have fun, you're gonna catch fish. It's kind of like doing a helicopter tour day with my wife. She had fun doing a helicopter tour. I did a little bit of research in the meantime. So why not invest that money to get better at it? And just pay attention. But you know, I can guarantee you that all these guys are going based on, if the fleet's over here, I'm gonna do my best to find something over here. You can always run to the fleet later and get frustrated by the Mad Mac trawlers. But if you wanna do well offshore, especially when there's fish scattered around anywhere, now would be the time to do it because there's just fish all over the place. So you don't have to worry about, oh, that's the only place there's fish. You've got a really good chance of running into them wherever you want, or wherever you end up. And you know, when you're doing this, you need to keep track of what's going on when you're looking around. So, you know, like I, I've, I've talked about a lot of this in the past, I'm gonna talk about it again. Um, you look at your SST chart, you look at your chlorophyll before you go. You get an idea of what the water temperature is and the basic location of color breaks. And you remember that. If you can't remember it, take a screenshot on your phone so you can look at it later. Once I leave the harbor, I'm every minute or two, I'm glancing down at the water temp. See if it changes at all. If it changes more than you know, 0.2 or 0.3 degrees, I'm taking a look over the side. Is the water any different in color? Was there a hard break? If I'm not seeing birds, I suddenly see birds, I'm looking and seeing is there a water temperature change here? Is there a color change here? Am I anywhere near a piece of structure underwater? So I'm running my chart on one, I, we had you know, two seven inch screens. I got my chart on one with the Simrad high res contours and all that stuff. And the other one, I got my fish finder set to constantly scan at to a depth of 200 feet. I'm not looking for tuna necessarily, I'm looking for bait. And if you don't have it set to run at 200 feet, it's gonna be trying to find it and it's gonna be you know, running at two feet or zero or you just have a blown out screen, doesn't do you any good at all. So if you see a color change or a temperature change and there's birds or anything, now you're looking, is there any bait balls on the meter? What am I seeing? Is there life here? Is there anything that a tuna might eat? Is this something that's worth coming back and looking at later on a tide? And as you run, you will notice changes in the ocean that you do not notice if you're not staring at your electronics the whole time. You know, the other day when we were uh, 
mm, three weeks ago or so, we're running that, and we had a hard three degree temp change. I mean, that is a massive one, and it was so strong and so sharp, there was actually a, a rip on the surface where it was, and later that afternoon, there was bluefin there on the cold, dirty side of that. So, you know, that is something that I just, there was nothing happening then, I logged it, I revisited it, and fish were there later. So, there's a lot of clues to pick up, and um, you can do this. I mean, it's not hard, but you know, when you get out there and you, know, you have your binoculars, if you see, start seeing, if there's a temperature change, if there's a color change, if you see some birds looking intently at something or acting in a certain way, stop the boat and blast around. If you're on a ridge, maybe run up or down it. If you're on a bank, maybe run to the other side of it and glass around again. Um, all these things will give you indications. If you see the boat in the, in the distance, it's got a huge prop wash and rod's been over in the back, those are Mad Mac guys, avoid them. If you think you see a boat and you see a, a fish foam behind it, that's their spreader bar, avoid them. Guys that are trolling Mad Max and spreader bars in a straight line in the middle of nowhere are not fishing properly. You know that. So don't get suckered in there. You got your binoculars, look at them from a distance, go, oh, yeah, got to avoid those guys. Go the other way. But if you just drive around peripherally around the edge of things, you will find fish of your own. And you will not have to share them with anyone, or you might have to share them with one or two other boats. Eventually, there are usually guys who are off the beaten path because they know what they're doing. So, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff there, but, uh, just think about it next time you're out looking offshore and uh, try and incorporate some of that into creating your next game plan. And I can guarantee you, you'll have a better chance of finding your own fish than you will if you just drive on tracks with your bales. And uh, with that, I'm going to end this week's video, and I hope you guys have a great weekend. I'll see you next week.